It's good to be back with you. I was gone last week at the pastor's conference that I go to every year. Every year when I come back, I'm incredibly grateful for Calvary Church. I get to go and be with uh, uh, good friends who are pastors all over the country, and it's always fun to kind of hear how things are going with them and to kind of share what's going on here. And I never fail to come home being incredibly thankful for the church I get to be a part of. And so I know you don't necessarily understand this, but for me, it is an unbelievable place to get to work. There are amazing staff here, amazing congregants, amazing leadership, and I go and listen to the stories that I hear from these other friends, and I'm grateful for the churches they're in, but I'm super grateful for Calvary Church. And so it's always fun to go and hear what's going on other places and to come back here and say, Lord, how in the world is it that you let me be a pastor here? It's so great. Now, one of the things that I enjoy about this conference that I go to is that there's an opportunity to take part in Christian hospitality. You can, of course, stay in a hotel if you want, but there's also an opportunity, if you want, to stay with some of the people in the church. This is a fun sort of thing to do. It's a chance to get to meet uh, new people and to get to fellowship and experience Christian hospitality. So this year, a friend of mine who's a pastor in Denver, he and I stayed with a young couple in the church. Their names are Aaron and Jeremy. And one morning as we were getting up, uh, uh, we were ready, getting ready sort of to leave to go to the conference at the church for the day, we were just sort of talking. And Aaron, uh, the wife, mentioned that just recently she had started getting up just 20 minutes early every morning. Now, she has a three-year-old and a one-year-old, and she talked about how it was very difficult to get up those 20 minutes earlier. But she mentioned how it had made all the difference. It had sort of changed her perspective on the day, and even though it was incredibly different, difficult, she couldn't and wouldn't go back to the way it was before. And she had committed herself uh, to getting up just these 20 minutes earlier for prayer, and she's in Bible study fellowship. And so I think she was doing her homework for Bible study fellowship, and it was this huge, huge blessing. Now the question is, is that why should that be the case? Is it just simply that getting up early in the morning is a good discipline? Is it just simply that maybe having some time to reflect on how the day is going to go, some time to kind of get your thoughts in mind before the three-year-old and the one-year-old wake up, is that all there is? No, I don't think so. I think what Aaron was discovering is a truth that is far deeper than just it's a good discipline or a good habit or a good practice. I think what she was discovering was a deep truth that's taught to us in Romans chapter 12, verse 2. So I'd like you to take a Bible, turn to Romans chapter 12, and we're going to look together at verse 2. Romans 12, if you're using one of the church Bibles, that's page 920. Romans 12, 1 and 2 are two of the most well-known and most beloved verses in the Bible. Many people have memorized these two verses because contained in them are some powerful truths that do indeed transform our lives. For the past number of weeks, we've sort of been camped out in Romans 12, 1, talking about the opportunity that you and I have to say back to God, thank you for all that he's done for us. That when we focus on all that God has done, is doing, and will do, our hearts swell with gratitude and we want to be able to say thank you. And in Romans 12.1, we've spent some time looking at the fact that God's love language is sacrifice. And we've taken three weeks to look in some different passages to kind of fill that out, and that when we offer to God engagement and involvement in our local church, when we offer to God something that we love, and when we offer to God our money and our energy and our time, these are expressions of gratitude and love to God for what he's done for us. 
This idea of sacrifice, of giving to the Lord something that is worthy of his name, continues on into Romans 12, and you'll hear it underlying the things that we're going to talk about. After all, it was a sacrifice for Aaron to get up 20 minutes early every morning. And if any of you have young children, you know. Those are the, perhaps the most valuable 20 minutes, that last little bit of sleep before the day begins. So there's still this idea of sacrifice. But now we move on in Romans 12 too to hear how else we can do things or offer to God things that are pleasing to him. Verse 2 of Romans 12 says, Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Now in this verse, we have what Pastor Tom referred to last week as a carrot. We talked about a carrot and a stick that God will often use things to motivate us. What we have in this verse is a carrot, a promise that God makes to us, a great and precious promise. Look at it with me. It's at the second half of the verse. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. What I want to do this morning is I want to talk a little bit about this promise that God is making to us, this carrot, this reward that God is offering to us. And then think about how it is that we achieve this. So first, begin by looking with me at this great promise that God has made. Essentially, the second half of Romans 12, 2 says, you and I can know and understand God's will. Now, God's will is an important concept in the scriptures. It's used many, many times, but it's often a confusing idea. And the reason it's confusing is because there are different aspects to God's will. And different people emphasize the different aspects of God's will. And as a result, when we use the language of God's will, it can be confusing. But to understand the promise that's being offered here, let me share with you from my perspective what I think are the four aspects to God's will. When we use the phrase, or when the scriptures use the phrase, God's will, there are sort of four different aspects to it. Number one, there are the things that God decrees. There are the things that God decrees. For example, in the book of Revelation, chapter 4, it says, You are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. This is talking about it was God's will to create the world. Now this was simply something he decreed he was going to do. It wasn't up for debate. It wasn't up for discussion. He didn't send it to committee. He simply decided to create the world the way the world has been created, and he simply decreed it to be the case. Consider also Ephesians chapter 1, verse 5. In love he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will. From the very beginning of time, God decreed that every single person who puts their faith in Jesus will be adopted as God's son or daughter. That's not up for debate. It's not up for discussion. It's not optional. Every single person who puts their faith in Jesus is adopted by God the Father. That's simply been decreed. That's the first aspect of God's will. There are some things that God simply decides and decrees that they are going to happen, and they happen. 
The second aspect of God's will is there are things that God demands. Earlier in the book of Romans, in chapter 2, verse 18, we read, If you know his will and approve of what is superior because you are instructed by the law. The moral commands in Scripture are part of God's will. That's different than his decree to create the world, but in his word, in his law, God gives moral demands that he requires you and I to obey. That's part of his will. Or consider 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. It's God's will that you should be sanctified, that you should avoid sexual immorality. Now you can sense the difference in these two aspects. The things that God decrees, those aren't optional. But the things that God demands, although we're required to obey, you and I all understand that God created us with free will and that sometimes people choose to disobey. But that's still an aspect of God's will. There are certain moral demands that he makes of every human being. So the second aspect of God's will is there are things that he demands. The third aspect of God's will, there are things that God desires. So he decrees certain things, he demands certain things, and he desires certain things. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 5 through 7 say, Therefore, when Christ came into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you prepared for me. With burnt offerings and sin offerings you were not pleased. Then I said, Here I am. It is written about me in the scroll. I have come to do your will, O oh God. That when Jesus came to earth, he not only fulfilled the moral demands that God made of him, he also fulfilled God's desires for his life, namely, he offered his life as a sacrifice on the cross. Now, there's no verse in the Bible that says every human being needs to die on a cross for people's sins. But that was what God desired for Jesus to do. So above the moral demands, there were things that God desires for each one of us to do. This is where when we talk about sacrifice or being living sacrifices, we are talking about offering to God things that he desires. There may not be a verse in the Bible that says you need to quit your job and give it to God, but God still may be asking you to do that. There may not be a particular verse that demands that every single human being lay down a child at the altar of God, but in your case, God may be asking you to do that. Consider as well Acts chapter 13, verse 22. After removing Saul, he made David their king. God testified concerning him, I have found David, son of Jesse, a man after my own heart, he will do everything I want him to do. Now the word for want in Greek is the same word that's been translated in all those other passages as will. Same idea. God is excited about David being king because David is not only going to obey the moral demands of Scripture, he's also going to offer God sacrifices that cost him something. He's going to give to God the things that God desires. And there are certain things that God desires from each one of us. Sacrifices that we can make that are pleasing to him. That's the third aspect of God's will. God decrees certain things. He demands certain things. He desires certain things. And then the fourth and final aspect... God directs certain things. So earlier in Romans chapter 1, Paul says, And I pray that now at last, by God's will, will the way may be open for me to come to you. Or in James chapter 4, 
Now listen, you who say today or tomorrow we will go to this city or that city, spend a year there, carry on business, and make money. Instead, you want to say, if it is the Lord's will, we will do this or that. Going for this city or that city, carrying on business, making travel plans, those are not moral issues. It's not wrong to go to this city and right to go to that city. It's not wrong for Paul to make plans to go to Rome. But what he's acknowledging is, even in the plans of life, God's will guides and directs us, and there are things in our lives that God wants to guide and direct. The travels that we're making, the business that we're involved in, the things that we engage in. That's the fourth aspect of God's will. There are things that God decrees, things that God demands, things that God desires, and things that God directs. Now with that in mind, back to Romans chapter 12, verse 2. The promise that is being made in the second half of Romans 12, verse 2 is, you will be able to test and to prove. In other words, you'll be able to know and understand God's will. Well, which aspect? All of them. What he's saying is, is you and I will have a better understanding of the things that God has decreed. We'll have a better understanding of the things that God demands. We'll have a better understanding and we'll be able to know what God desires. And we'll have a better understanding of God's direction in our lives. Because frankly speaking, there are some things that God decrees that are hard to understand. Why did God create the world the way he's created it? Why did God choose to have predestination and free will and somehow have those work together? There are things that God demands that are hard to know and understand. Why should it be that God has forbidden sexual immorality uh, or sexual relationships outside of the bounds of marriage? When God says that a wife is supposed to submit to her husband and a husband is supposed to give himself for his wife, that's difficult to understand. It's hard to know what that means. Likewise, it can be difficult to know and understand. What does God desire from me? Does he want me to offer? What sacrifice could I offer him that would be pleasing to him? Is he calling on me to lay down my job? That's hard to understand. Likewise, if you're trying to decide where you're supposed to go to college, if you're trying to decide, should I get involved in this situation that my grandkids are going through or not, it's difficult to know. What is God directing in this situation? The promise of Romans 12, too, is that you and I will know and understand better all these aspects of God's will. Whether it's a theological question or a Christian living question or something you want to give to God that you're not sure about or something you're looking for guidance or direction in your life, the promise of Romans 12 too is you and I can know and understand God's will. His good, pleasing, and perfect will. Which raises the question, how? How? <laughs> How do we get that carrot? How do we receive that promise? How do we experience that ability to know and understand the things God decrees, demands, desires, and directs? Well, that's the first half of Romans 12. So let's look at that. I have an illustration here that I hope is going to help make clear what Paul is saying in the first half of Romans 2, or Romans 12, verse 2. But first we need to notice that there are two commands in the first half of the verse. Do not conform to the pattern of this world. That's the first command. It's something for us not to do or something for us to stop doing. But be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That's something we are supposed to do. So let's start with this first part. Do not conform to the pattern of this world. Now, some of you may be familiar with a translation that says, do not be conformed to the pattern of this world. 
That's because in Greek, the verb that's used there could either be active, the way the NIV is translated, or it can also be passive, which is the way I think it ought to be translated, which is the idea that you and I don't have to do any work to be conformed to the pattern of this world. It's simply a result of living in this world and being engrossed in the things of this world. Let me use an illustration to try to explain what I mean. Imagine I got a, I don't know what you call this, a vase? I got a big jar here. Imagine that this represents our minds. And the idea is, suppose I spent the past few weeks and months watching the presidential debates, reading about the political process and the, and the, and the things that are going on uh, regard, uh, with regard to the election and those sorts of things. Imagine that this represents sort of all the time that I've spent doing that. It was interesting. I was reading an article in the Wall Street Journal uh, just yesterday. He was talking about how Netflix viewership is down and movie viewing is down and the NFL viewing is down because so many people are watching the presidential uh, election material. And in the article, one of the guys said, you know, sometimes I have to turn off all the debates and turn on Netflix so that I can mellow out and stop being so angry. <laughs> the point is, is the time we spend doing those things begins to fill our minds with the way the world thinks. There's not something you have to do for that to happen. It's simply as we live in the world and as we engage with what's going on in the world, our minds are conformed to the world's way of thinking. Or consider this jar with these ping pong balls in it to represent the time that we spend flipping through a beauty magazine. As we go and we look at what the world thinks about what beauty is, as we think about body image, as we think about dress and whether we should dress modestly or immodestly, the more we spend time flipping through that magazine or looking online, the more it begins to fill our mind with the world's thoughts. Or consider these to be sort of the time or the thoughts that we've spent thinking about money and retirement, uh, trying to plan for getting out of debt, doing our retirement score, checking our investments, sort of every time we go online to see, well, how is this stock doing or how is that investment doing? What Romans 12, 2 is saying is that when we allow our mind to be filled with those thoughts, the result is our mind is filled with those thoughts. The time we spend thinking about those things naturally begins to conform our mind to the pattern of the world's thinking. Or consider this jar of ping pong balls. Maybe the time that we've spent thinking about uh, what high school we go to or what college we're going to attend and thinking about where our school ranks in accordance, uh, in comparison to other schools or thinking about how all the things that our teachers have told us about how great our school is or how wonderful that school is or listening to someone brag about what's going on at their school or thinking about which school is the better value for the money or thinking about what kind of degree that you're getting. All those thoughts about where it is that you rank in intellectual achievement and progress and what are your test scores and are you getting in, all that time we spend thinking about those things fills our mind with the thoughts of this world. And how about this last one here? Maybe this represents the time that we spent in the senior adults uh, living facility in which we live sort of complaining about the administration that's there. Maybe it represents the time in the teacher's lounge when we're sort of talking about uh, the administration and what fools they are for the decisions that they've made. Maybe it represents the time on social media when we're reading all those sort of snarky Twitter comments and we're sort of uh, thinking about what fools there are in this world who are making decisions. As we do those things, our mind is filled with the thoughts of the world. And the point of Romans 12 too is you don't have to do something to conform your mind to the pattern of this world's thinking. 
Our minds are sort of like empty vases, and as we pour thoughts into them, they accumulate in our mind. Now you think, I know what you're thinking. I think the same thing. Well, but how would you ever stop that from happening? We're not supposed to turn off the internet and we're not supposed to unplug the television and we're not supposed to refuse to engage in the presidential election process and we're not supposed to not have any social media or ever talk to anybody ever again. You're right. We are not supposed to leave this world. That would be unchristian. But I like the way that 1 Corinthians 7.31 says it. It says, those who use the things of the world should live as if not engrossed in them. For this world in its present form is passing away. And the Bible is recognizing, look, this is a natural result of living life in the world, but it is possible to spend less time or to be less engrossed in the thinking of the world. It is possible to spend less time or less energy in absorbing all the things that the world is teaching. Now still, even if we're not engrossed in the world, we still interact with the world. And as a result, the world's way of thinking still fills our mind with its thoughts. Which is why there is the second command in Romans 12 too, Which says, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Now Romans 12 too doesn't say how the renewing of your mind happens. But we know from other places in Scripture, this is a work of the Holy Spirit brought about especially through His Word. Whether we're using His Word during times of prayer, whether we're meditating on His Word, memorizing His Word, listening to sermons about His Word, going to Bible study where His Word is being uh, talked about, being in discussion groups where we're reading His Word for fun, whatever it is, God's Word is designed to renew our mind and to cleanse it from the world's thoughts. So I have that represented here by this picture of water. Water can often represent the Spirit. So imagine that after all this time we've spent watching uh, the presidential debates and election politics and all those things. Imagine that a little bit later in Romans chapter 12, We read statements that say, love your enemy. As much as possible, live at peace with those around you. That submit yourselves to government and to those who are in uh, positions of authority. Because this is what God has called you to do. Imagine that after we've spent this time looking in this beauty magazine... Imagine that we come to God's Word and we read things like in 1 Peter 3, which says things like, do not let your beauty come from outward appearance or adornment. Do not allow yourself to be consumed with wearing immodest dress, but dress appropriately. Realize that God does not look on outward appearance, but on what's going on in the heart. Realize that beauty is vain and charm is deceitful. Or when we think about the idea of money and we read in the scriptures about the rich man who built his barns. Sometimes you got to give the ping pong balls a little little push. We read about the rich man who built his barns and stored up for retirement but was not rich in accordance with the things in God's kingdom. We hear God say, don't put your hope in money, it's uncertain. We hear God say, seek first my kingdom and my righteousness and all these things will be added to you. Or imagine that as the Holy Spirit uses the verses like in Romans 12, 3 that say, do not think more highly of yourself than you ought to think, but think soberly in accordance with how God has given to each one a measure of his grace when we read about the fact that the race does not go to the swift or to the intelligent, but to those who put their trust in God. 
that we meet about the fact that God has said pride goes before a fall, that God gives grace to the humble, but he opposes the proud. When we hear God say these things, it begins to flush out the thinking in our mind and to fill us with the Spirit's thinking. Or when we go into the, into the teacher's uh, lounge, when we're talking to the friends at our, uh, at our community center, when we're on social media and we hear God say, don't slander your neighbor, whether online or in person. We hear God say, submit to authority because all authority has been given by God. We hear God say, don't covet. I have given you all that you need and will provide all that you could ever hope for or want in a way that is a blessing to you. The point is when we do those things, when our mind is filled with the thoughts of the Spirit, there is no room, literally, no room for the thoughts of the world. What God is saying is, listen, simply living life in this world will fill our mind with the world's way of thinking. The problem with the world's way of thinking is it will confuse us in thinking about things the way that God thinks about them. And so it's only natural that if you have theological questions, if you've got morality questions, if you've got questions about what you could give to God that he might desire, if you've got questions about how God might be directing, if your mind is filled with the thoughts of the world, you will not be able to know and understand what God's will is. Have you ever seen anyone who's gone off to college and spent a whole bunch of time studying philosophers and thoughts who comes back and thinks, well, maybe God didn't create the world the way he said he created the world, or maybe God is wrong in the, what he says about sexual immorality or about marriage or about submission or about husbands sacrificing for their wives. Have you ever seen anyone who spent so much time in the teacher's lounge or on the social media or in the, in the neighborhood gossiping and arguing and being unsubmissive who finds themselves unable to hear what God might be saying to them about their job, about how they can be a witness, about how they might be able to lay down something at his feet. This is the truth that God is saying, is as our minds are filled with the world's way of thinking, and there's not something you have to do to cause that to happen. We simply live life in this world, and our mind is filled with the world's thinking. But the promise of God is that God's spirit is bigger and stronger and greater. And that as he fills our mind with his word, there simply isn't room for the thoughts of the world. And the great news is it doesn't matter how long those ping pong balls have been in there. The power of that water, and a little help from me, <laughs> removes them from the place. We don't have to go in and surgically remove each one. Simply filling our mind with the Spirit cleanses and cleans and fills our minds with God's Word. That's why God says, if you do this, the promise is you will be able to know and understand God's will that once you push out the world's thinking, it will make more sense why God created this world the way he created this world. It will make more sense why God has made the moral demands that he has made. Apart from the spirit and apart from the word, God's sexual ethics don't make any sense. But filled with the thoughts of the spirit, they do. But the promise is, is that if there's something that God might be asking you to give him to quit your job, to lay down a relationship, that when you're filled with the world's way of thinking, you'll never see that. We'll think, I've got to hold on to this job. I've got to fight for every part, uh, anything that's ever been given to me. And God says, trust me, there is nothing you could ever give me that I will not give you back far more. If there's questions that we have about where to go to college, about whether to get involved in a situation that our grandkids might be going through, if our minds are filled with the world's way of thinking... We're going to fight tenaciously to get into a particular college. That might not be the college that would be best for us, but filled with the world's way of thinking, there's no way to know that. 
filled with the world's way of thinking. We're going to jump into that situation with our grandkids and we're going to work and work and try to make it the way we want it to be. That might not be what God would direct us to do in this situation. But the promise of God is, as your mind is filled with his word, you will know and understand what his will is. So here's an assignment for you this week. I'd like you to consider some activity that you're doing that is allowing your mind to be filled with the world's way of thinking. And I'd like you to consider shutting it off this week. I'm not saying abstain from it forever. Some form of social media, perhaps. Maybe you're the kind of person who shouldn't be reading about the presidential elections currently. Now, I'm not saying you shouldn't pray about them. You understand the difference, right? Right? Maybe you shouldn't be reading all of that stuff, what pundits are having to say and watching clips about those kinds of things. Maybe you need to not go to the teacher's lounge this week. Maybe you need to not participate in that book club, which actually is just simply about talking about other people in ways that aren't appropriate. Whatever it might be, something that you're filling your mind with this week, just don't do that. And instead... Take whatever time and fill it with God's Word. Memorize Romans 12, 1 and 2. You're not going to be sorry. They're fabulous verses. Go back and re- read through Romans 12. Get up in the morning 20 minutes earlier. I know you might have a three-year-old. I know you might have a one-year-old, but try it. Join that Bible study group or that neighborhood Bible study where they're going to be talking about God's Word. Read the Bible for fun. You might be a person who loves to read novels. This week, put that novel down and read the Bible. You're like, well, the Bible's not. Go to the book of Samuel. Start in Samuel 1 and read the story of Samuel, Saul, and David. It's gripping novel reading. Enjoy it. Whatever it may be, do something this week that will fill your mind with God's word and test God in this. See if at the end of this week, there aren't certain things about God's will and who he is that you seem to understand better. Do this especially if you've got questions about things that God might have decreed. Or if you've got questions about, well, that doesn't seem right that God would be demanding that. Or if you've got questions about, is God asking me for some sort of sacrifice? Or if you've got decisions that you're needing direction from God. The reason why Aaron, this young mother that I told you about at the beginning of the sermon, the reason why that 20 minutes every morning was making such a difference, it's not because she was getting up early and getting started on her day. It's because she was living out the promise of Romans 12 too. If you fill your mind with the word of God, the spirit of God will push out the thoughts that come from the world. And you'll be able to see your day and your children, and your life, and God more clearly. It's a promise that's made not just to early risers, not just to really disciplined people, not just to people who've been Christians a long time. It is a promise made to every single Christian, you and I. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, then you will be able to test and to prove what God's will is, his good, perfect, and pleasing 